Hello, and thanks for joining me on another edition of the Real Money Stories podcast. I'm your host, Jason Butler, and today I'm joined by another one of my, um, how can I put it, uh, someone I've respected for years and years. When I first joined financial services, this individual you're going to hear from today was kind of um, one of the good guys, a leading light of someone that you kind of just knew you could trust that was a, a beacon of truth and, and knowledge and wisdom. So um, he's a broadcaster, he's a writer, he's a campaigner, and he's a thoroughly good good guy. And I'm really pleased to say that we've got Mr. Paul Lewis on the show today. Hello, Paul. Hello. Hello. Well, after that introduction, what can I say? Thank Absolute, you very much for inviting absolutely. me. No, not at all. Look, just like everything, Paul, uh, you seem to have been around forever, and I know you're very youthful looking, <laughs> but in my life, I joined financial services in 1990, and you kind of just always been there. So um, mm. thank you for all the work you've done yeah. over the years. But um, you know, this show is about breaking down the taboo of talking about money, the role yeah. in your life, and, and for people to help themselves help themselves. So we'll, we'll obviously touch on some of your thoughts on what you've learned about money, but I, I'm interested to know what your early experiences were when you were growing up, kind of the, the, the influences and the values and the beliefs that you developed around money, um, you know, so that sort of people can understand their own journey. Yes, I suppose. I mean, when I was growing up, we had pounds, shillings and pence. So it was, right. um, <laughs> it was rather different from how it is now. Uh, and I remember being really enthralled by the different coins and what they were worth and how they added up. And when you you know, 12 pence in a shilling and 20 shillings in a pound. And that, that engaged my mind. I remember once I was in a shop when I was just learning this and my mother was buying something and it was two and sixpence, two and six, we used to say, two shillings and sixpence. It was two 12p, and six. 12p. Uh, and I said, why don't they just say eight? And I hadn't, because I didn't understand oh. it was two shillings and sixpence. And yeah. then she taught me that. And I think, I think both my mother and my father taught me a great deal. My father was a mathematician. My mother, well, they were both teachers. And I think they taught me about money. I remember having a post office set and, you know, you had to count things out and give change and all that kind of stuff. I really liked that. It's sad, I suppose, but I did. So that was my childhood with money. Um, and then I suppose money for me has just, it's just been a, it's been a means to an end really. Um, and you just have to try and earn as much as you can. And when I had my first job, I also wrote, I've always wanted to be a writer. I wasn't a writer till I was about 30, but I've always wanted to be a writer. And I used to write in my spare time. I used to write for I, I, my first job was with Age Concern, which is Age UK now. And I used to write things for them. Um, and I wrote leaflets, booklets, pamphlets, articles, right from when I, even when I was an employee in my spare time, partly to earn extra money, partly because I loved it. Mm. So that was really my background. And I suppose working for Age Concern and then a One Parent Families charity, and then I ran a charity for young unemployed people, campaigning for them, I must say, not, not actually giving them work. Um, I was always interested in explaining to people who couldn't afford an accountant, who couldn't afford a financial advisor, not that such things existed many years ago, financial advisors, um, explaining the complexities of money, whether it's benefits or tax uh, or other things you can get from the state, like young people with what was then the youth training scheme. All those things interested me a lot. Mm, mm. And that's where my background is. It's not investment, it's not economics, it's getting real information to real people about mm. the money that they need. Yeah, and I, and I know you've done a lot of work there, but I just, I don't want to leave your childhood for a minute because I want to understand the motivations for you because, because for many people, money is scary. It is abstract. It can become a god. It can become a, a, the be all and end all. It can be part of the inextricably linked with their self-identity and their sense of self-worth. Uh, and some people, it's, they associate money with, if they're not good at maths, they can't be good with money. So I'm just interested how you develop your money identity um, when you were sort of a teenager. Did you do work? I mean, were you in a, did you grow up in a wealthy family or was it quite sort of... Um, no, modest? no. I mean, no, my, my father was a, a maths teacher and my mother taught, um, went round house to house teaching uh, children and young people who um, had mental uh, mental capacity problems, I suppose right. we'd say now. Mm. Um, and I went round with her and I met a lot of these people. Um, my father was the mathematician. He gave me my love of maths and numbers mm. and mm. all those sort of things. Um, 
without any question. He was immensely influential. And so was my mother. They were both careful with money. They didn't have that much money. Mm. Um, and they were also careful about borrowing it. And, and my mother wow. always drummed into me from <laughs> as early as I could remember, you know, buy your own house. You know, that is the most important thing, buy a house. Mm. And, and they did do that. And where, where we lived and then they, they moved from time to time. Um, and it was that sense of, it was important to have that financial stability. And also I think the thing I learned was with good debt and bad debt. I mean, they were never, they were always, they always said they were hard up, you know, a couple of <laughs> teachers with three children inevitably. Yeah. Um, but they did borrow money, but they borrowed it, sense that they borrowed it for a purpose and they knew what they do with it. Right. I remember they had an extension built on the house and my father showed me the cheque and I, I was probably a thousand pounds or something, which then to me seemed when I was about 13, 12, it just seemed the largest sum of money I'd ever seen. Mm. Um, and they taught, certainly taught me about banking and how to make write a cheque and make sure you wrote it in the right way. I mean, most people listening probably think, what on earth are you going on about? So it was being careful with money was part of how I was brought up. And I think I, I always have been careful with money. So the takeaway there, just for some people listening, um, is that if you talk to your children or young people um, about the positives of money and uh, confront the, the potential dangers of it, and show by example, then that's generally a good a good thing, isn't it? Because this is the problem, learn bad behaviours from parents to children. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I mean, I've thought back on these times recently because I've read quite a lot about how important it is that, or at least how influential parents are, that how they manage their money and how they talk to children affect those people for the rest of their lives. And I've always thought financial education begins at home, not at school. And I think mm. that is so important. Mm. And looking back, I think, well, yes, I suppose I did do that. And I have to say my own children, I call them children, my own adults, um, uh, are all very sensible with money. And I don't remember ever particularly talking to them and so sitting them down and saying, this is what you must do. But I think they kind of Im imbibe those habits from from their parents and I certainly wasn't well off when mm. I was um, when they were growing up either not mm. at all mm. um, so I, I think you do learn a lot from your parents and it it's how they how they deal with money is very 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 important and I can't stress that enough to parents of young children listening make mm. sure you just as part of conversation as part of life not sitting mm. down doing homeschooling mm. talk to your children about money how it works so they understand how it works and how you've managed your money and indeed how you've mismanaged it mistakes to avoid all uh, those kind of things yeah immensely important it's mm -hmm. interesting you say my daughter works for me and she started working for me in the summer after she graduated and she looked at my whole back catalogue um and obviously i've been around a long long time not as a broadcaster like you but writing books and keynotes and all sorts of stuff and she looked at the whole back catalogue and she said it was like the it was like a even though she's been around obviously as growing up she said it was like a sort of a baptism of fire learning everything and everything and what she didn't realize was that i was a complete train wreck in my 20s with debt now here's the thing you're absolutely right if as parents we can share our mistakes as well as our successes then we're actually demystifying mm. money aren't we so mm. tell me mm. about um you went to university didn't you Yes, I did. Yes, yeah. Yes. How did you navigate the university years with money? Because that can be a real problem for people, <laughs> can't it? <laughs> well, managing money for the very first time is always trouble, a trouble, isn't it? I was what, 18, 19. Um, and I remember very clearly, <laughs> I always had an overdraft. I thought, great, oh, really? I have an overdraft. I can Seriously? spend more than I've got. Well, the student grant then was, I mean, it was a grant, not a loan, I have to yeah. say, which... Yeah. You know, let me just say now, I think it should be now. I don't mm. agree with student loans in any way. Um, and I can't remember what it was. It wasn't very much. And my parents used to chip in the extra bit they were responsible for. Right. And I remember that I used to take five pounds a week out of the bank branch in the university where I was at. It was the University of Stirling. Right. And that was it. That was it for me. And that was quite, you know, quite a lot. But I did go overdrawn. And then in the summer I worked and I paid it off. And I remember going to see the bank manager, you know, all these things you never do now. <laughs> I went to see the bank manager at the Bank of Scotland. Yeah. Um, and I said, um, I would like, um, I would like to borrow a bit more money to go on holiday in the summer before I start work. <laughs> yeah. And he was a very doer. 
and to be very elderly man he was probably probably about 40 and he said well oh, can, can i see your checkbook mr lewis and i said yeah i gave him my checkbook and he looked at it and he said mm, i see you don't fill the stubs in and oh. i said no i sort of have a mental picture of how much i've got i know what i've got in the account yeah. and i get my statements and he opened a drawer in his desk he put the checkbook in it closed the drawer and said you can have that back when you manage your money a bit better no, seriously. <laughs> request refused what a great lesson uh, it, it was absolutely extraordinary looking back on it um and I suppose it made me think, and after that, I did actually fill the stubs in, as I remember, and did start keeping a sort of bit of a tally, but not, not much. I'd wait for the statement. Um, and of course, then when you've got a statement, you've overdrawn it. It was in red ink. Isn't this extraordinary? Yeah, That's what yeah. being in the red means. The yeah. statement came in black and red ink. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so I never had enough money at university, even though I worked. And I used to sell... I used to sell private iron things on campus to make a bit more money during the term time as well. But I never had enough money. Um, and that was the state I was in for some years after that, I have to say, actually. <laughs> so, so this is an interesting one. Um, even though your parents were very, very organised, taught you well, for example, um, you know, weren't uh, big debt people, used it perhaps for house, to buy the house and extensions, you slipped into what I call sleepwalked into debt yeah. without even yeah. really thinking about it because it was an overdraft, just like a credit card, similar thing, right? Yes. And it was very cheap then. I mean, yes, you paid some interest on the mm. extra bit, as you do now, now mm. that we've had this yes. change in the yes. rules by the Financial Conduct Authority, and thank goodness for them. But it was very cheap borrowing. Mm. Um, and I remember even later, I mean, this is moving on, but when I, when I became self-employed, I always thought the first thing I must do is 25% of every fee I get for writing, it goes straight in a separate account. Mm. So with my bank, I had my current account and I had a separate account to pay yep. the tax from. Right. And I would have an overdraft on the current account, even though I had a positive balance in the savings account. Now, most people would say that's nonsense. Mm. For me, that savings account was my sleep at night money. I knew that when that tax bill came, as it inevitably would, mm. and it was a bit less formal than it is now with self-assessment, I could pay it because I had the money in a separate account. No. And I did this for years that every fee I got, 25% went straight into a separate account. And that stopped me ever getting in debt with the tax authorities, which mm. is perhaps the most important thing never mm. to do. Mm. Now, it's interesting because what you're, you're illustrating there is a concept that we call partitioning or labelling or mental accounting. Yeah. So essentially, you've jam, got your jam, jam jars. jars. My, it, my, yeah. my, my granny had the rent, the water, the electric, all that above the fireplace yeah. in the little yeah. jars. And you've done the same thing. And that can work now. That's what I do in my smart spending system, the smart yes. spending plan, which you can download from the website. And it's just a way of partitioning the mm. purpose of money and mm. even though you had an overdraft you realize you had to pull your finger out and get some more work right so that was a you weren't kidding yourself now just just head back a bit because um i'm interested in to know uh, the transition when you went from being an employee so so you weren't brilliant with money to start with you had overdrafts you weren't so you were starting to fill out the checkbook stubs you were an employee for a number of years was there an epiphany a pivotal time or was it a gradual change to becoming slightly more what I call in control of your day-to-day -day spending and having a bit of reserves and did that happen before you became self-employed or afterwards? Gosh I'm trying to think I don't think when I was first married and we had young children and I was um, an employee then I don't remember having spare money in a savings account no mm. no apart from my tax account because I did even when I did freelance work, I did used to keep money separate. Um, I remember that by the end of the month, I was usually a bit overdrawn, mm. um, and that was because you know we needed things, needed things for ourselves and for the fam for the children. Mm. Needed to, we needed to go on holiday, the famous holiday <laughs> conversation yeah, with my yeah, bank manager. Yeah. Um, but you do when you've got kids and you're both working, you know, you need to, you need to take them away. So I was, I was overdrawn towards the end of most months. Absolutely. Um, and my solution to that was to earn more. And it still is. It always has been. If I need more money, I might borrow it in the short term, but I will earn more money. So I would work more. I, I do more in my spare time. Um, uh, so I, I suppose the transition was that I always, I was never in trouble with money. I never had real debt problems at all. Um, and when 
credit cards came out, which was actually a bit after that, wasn't it? Quite a bit after that. Um, I never got into difficulty with credit cards, though I would often have a balance on them, a, a debt balance on them. But I did, I think looking back, I, I must have used them sensibly because I never got into serious debt ever. Mm. I was often slightly on the wrong side with the bank, but you know, it was very cheap money and I didn't care that much. So let's, this is really illuminating and thank you for sharing and being handy because even you, the money supremo, who is super, super, <laughs> you know, knowledgeable about things, in your early life, you were what I call shades of grey when it came to money, right? You weren't in a real hole and neither were you flush with cash and super, super organised and Mr. Spreadsheet man. No, no. But, but there was that shade of grey because there were pressures. And the fact there were pressures meant there was a little bit of haziness around the edge, didn't mean you were a bad person, and you did eventually sort of move forward. So um, how did you, what was the uh, motivation and what were the implications of you going from becoming an employee to self-employed? Bear in mind, you had these slight cash flow wrinkles, as it were. Well, it, it was a moment, and I remember it very well. Um, I'd worked, as I, as I think I said, for three charities, and the last one, which was called Youth Aid, it was a youth unemployment campaigning charity, I was a director and I did spend a lot of my life raising money to pay the salaries of me and my colleagues. So it felt very precarious. There were times when you just made it, you know, you just managed to get a big grant from a, a trust or help. Sometimes occasionally you've got a bit of money from um, state sources, not the government, but local authority sources. Um, so it was a very precarious life. And I've been doing a lot of a lot more writing in my spare time, regular writing. I wrote for Saga magazine, um, and that was a regular contract to do that. And I wrote pamphlets and leaflets and things like that. Going back to age concern, I wrote things for them for money once I'd left them. So I was I was working a lot in the evenings, and then I won a journalism prize for some things I wrote in Saga magazine. This was 1986, right. and. I thought to myself, oh gosh, if I can win a prize part-time journalist, I can make a living at it. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna give up this job and I'm going to work full-time. And I did some calculations and I got another regular contract with the Daily Telegraph to write for their money section. And the thing that I had, and I think this is important if anybody listening has had a dream of being a journalist and wants to be a writer. You need a specialty that no one else does, you know. Don't do pop music. Don't do holidays. Don't do travel. Um, have something that no one else looks at. And what I had, my unique selling point, was I was writing about money for people without much money. Tax, mm. uh, benefits, government assistance, all that kind of stuff. Um, pensions, uh, maybe state pensions, other pensions that mainly state then. And so I had that unique thing. And of course, editors kind of loved it because they thought, well, we're actually serving a different audience. It will actually bring more people in because the Telegraph, you know, like what it like it is now was very much a paper for better off people. Um, and so I had that unique selling point and I just plugged it and I got a lot of work writing for all sorts of outlets. Um, I also wrote about technology briefly, uh, uh, about computer games um, and things like that. But mainly it was about money and it was that unique selling point. And that's what led me on to doing other things. And I'll just say that when I left my job and I had two or three initially, and then it grew, people who paid me money to do things and it was all my money and I was in control of it and I could buy what I needed for the business and you know, I had to do all my own tax. Suddenly I was in control and I thought, well, okay, if one of these editors takes against me, the other two or three will carry on. So mm -hmm. I was actually more secure then as a freelance than I felt as an employee working for a fairly precarious charity. And that was also the motivation. And, you know, and people said, well, what kept you going? Well, how do you sit down every day working at home to write things and I just say well the postman arrives in the morning with the bills so of course I <laughs> sit down and earn money those are the days when the postman did arrive yeah, with the yeah, bill in yeah, the morning yeah. um, and so it was that interchange bills had come in I'd send things off it was all by post then um, and that was how I managed my life and it was a bit hand to mouth but slowly things grew and it was because I looked at money for people without much money 
that I began to get work um, on air and I began to do the advice I gave in my columns, I began to do on television and uh, on the radio. And that is what led to me being a presenter and doing what I do now. Mm. Now, there's, there's three things that I just want to touch on there, which are timeless pieces of advice and really important for mindset. One is you saw there was more risking being an employee for a precarious charity that may or may not stay in business than having five or six freelance customers mm. or clients. That was yeah. interesting. Secondly, your view was if you needed more money um, and the expenses couldn't be dropped, you had to go and earn more money. Um, yes. And therefore, you felt more in control of being able to earn more money. And thirdly, yes. this is really important. You you play to your strength, didn't you? Your niche, your there's something mm. you had that other people didn't have yes. in a crowded field. So so I think that's wonderful. It's not that everyone should be self-employed or everyone should be an entrepreneur, mm. but that's a great three great lessons yeah. there from you, Paul. And yeah. you've been doing it now what, for 30, 30, 34 <laughs> years. Is that right? Oh, at not least sure if it's oh, for you. Uh, oh, <laughs> Full time since 1986, so whatever yeah. that is, 35 years this 35, year. 35, yeah. Um, and, you so you know, before that, for, <laughs> for at least 10 years before that, I was doing it part time, but yeah. not as a self-employed person. And I think the other thing that I would say is uh, when you do, when you, if people want to be writers, when you sit down and write, you know, the, the two lessons I learned right at the start was deadlines, it's no good if it's late, and length, mm. it's no good if it's, 200 words too long yeah. and that is a discipline and yeah. I remember once I did write something that was too long it was for the Times Educational Supplement I think it was 100 words too long and I just thought oh you know they'll squeeze it in they didn't the yeah. sub-editor cut it at and they the cut the bits you word. don't want them to cut yeah yeah he yeah. just cut it at the 300th yeah. word yeah. and it just ended <laughs> good grief I mean it was bad sub-editing to be fair yeah. but it was it was a bit of a lesson but Get it being reliable. I mean, this is what you've got to be reliable, Anything accurate yeah. to time mm. to length. Yeah. It, it is the most important thing but, about, but about being the, a that's the, But that's the point in anything in life being consistent, uh, doing what you say you're going to do. And having some form of, as you say, sort of when, what does good look like? You've got to know what good look like, whether it's a date or the amount. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. look, I just want to touch on two particular things before we sort of um, uh, let you go today. Um, I'm interested to know how you and your wife have evolved your, because this issue with couples, particularly when people get older, um, or there's a change in their circumstances, divorce or bereavement. Um, I'm just interested to know how you have resolved or how you develop uh, as a couple your approach to managing the family's finances. Do you, do you, because you're the head honcho, do you do it all or does your wife deal with the day to day or you're just big picture? How have you evolved it? Uh, well, I, I divorced my wife a very long time ago. Oh, okay. So I'm not, I'm not, I, I have, a, I have, I am married, but um, the yeah. wife that I grew up, I uh, developed with, with children yeah. and so on, I divorced a very long time ago. Right. Okay. But I think, I think the way that we we dealt with it, and that certainly the way that we deal with things now, is is first of all honesty and straightforwardness, um, knowing what other people have, knowing what you can do, mm. discussing anything major, whether it's change of job or change of aspect or indeed mm. big expenditure, mm. discuss it and talk about mm. it. Um, and my view is that couples should always keep separate accounts. Now, OK, you have a joint account for the household expenditure and you each put in either 50 50 or if one of you earns a great deal more than the other, maybe 70, 30, 80, mm. 20, something that feels fair to you. And again, mm. Mm. it's about talking. Mm. Do what feels fair. And then your money is what's left and you can do what you like with it. Mm. And as long as you're fulfilling that obligation to pay your share of the, the living expenses, what you do with your own money is should be absolutely up to you. No one should comment on it. By mm. no one, I mean the other partner shouldn't yes. comment on it. Mm. Yeah. Um, unless, of course, you're doing something like, you know, spending it on, I don't know, alcohol and damaging your health. I mean, that kind or of gambling thing. gambling. But, yeah. but, you know, gam oh, gambling particularly. You know, let, let's make it clear that if somebody in my household was gambling, I would be talking about it a great deal. But that's a values yes. thing, isn't it? That's a values yes, thing. That's is. not a, yeah. Uh, as long as you're buying stuff for yourself, you know, you might have a great interest in, I don't know, it, um, in uh, in trainers or something like mm. that. Mm. You know, people do. Or, or Stamps. You know, yeah. It, yeah, in my in my case, I, I collect old books. Mm. Um and you should be absolutely free. It's your money, mm. free to spend it. Mm. I suppose the other thing is that now I'm in the, the circumstances I'm in. Um, 
I'm very fortunate to have enough money. You know, I'm not worrying at the end of every month where I'm going to spend and my spending has gone down because this house here is paid for. So that's the kind of thing one can hope for when you get to be my age. But it, it certainly wasn't the case until I was, well, it wasn't the case until probably 10 years ago, actually, that I felt that I actually had enough money coming in to do what I wanted. And that's a very good point. Knowing enough, it's really important because I, 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 I learned what was enough when I was 48. Uh, and that doesn't mean I'm super wealthy. It just means that I, I work because I want to, not because I have to, because we've got a very low cost lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. care what anyone else has got. And once you know your values, as you're absolutely right, and yeah. what matters to you in your circumstances, yeah. Yeah. where you are now, because we're changing as people, aren't we? That's, that's a very yeah. important point. Yeah. I just wanted to touch on um, the issue about your children. They've all turned out to be quite, you, you said sensible with money or good with money. Do, yeah. do you, do you, can you think back? Did you, was it just by example or was it because you, you, you chatted freely about money or what was it? Do you think, what, what were the takeaways from how your children turned out? Or were they just naturally, you know? Well, <laughs> sometimes in a completely, I, I, I think this is nonsense, but sometimes I think maybe it's genetic, <laughs> maybe it's hereditary <laughs> because yeah. Uh, yes, I talked to them. I mean, particularly when they were at university, and obviously I would give them money towards their costs. Um, and you know, we talk about it, and they would—they were just sensible. And I just think they're, you know, they're intelligent, sensible people, and they, they handled it very well. Um, and you know, some of them are better off than others, but they're—they're they're all perfectly fine. So that they are all very good with money. Mm. whether they've got it or they don't have it you know they don't have it when they've also read it. your books over the years and been an avid listeners of money box obviously on radio well <laughs> yes i mean I, I i have written i have written some books in the past but they're all out of date now um which did contain this kind of simple mm. advice money yes. magic is still a, a book that's if you can get a copy of uh, paul's money magic it is money magic isn't it that was a good book <laughs> i i've still got a copy somewhere i mean you know yes um, it, I, I did money magic i did beat the banks i yeah. did pay less tax yeah. uh, none of them sold very well I have but they were say. timeless stuff in them even if even if you yeah. you know you look back we can always do better but so so that's yeah. interesting so you, you don't think they read your books or listen to money box but never mind well, so, I, no i i think they probably did those things i think they, they knew what i did and uh, yeah i mean i did i so did there was aware, about financial there was an, issues an awareness then there was an awareness because a of the role you absolutely did. yes yeah. there was there, okay. yes there was but i i could not possibly say i actually taught them about mm. money mm. but as i said earlier children sort of imbibe this from their yeah. parents without either side being conscious of it sometimes yeah. and i think that's very important and there are just two things I want you to comment on before you go. Um, one was just if you are someone in a very precarious or difficult situation mm. in your life financially, you know what it's like, you can't breathe, you can't yeah. think straight. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want your top tips for those people to try and get to move forward. And secondly, uh, what your view is about people who don't necessarily feel ultra wealthy, but probably have enough of their needs and how they might be thinking about how much is enough to help the next generation and when should that happen you know should you wait till you die or should you perhaps be thinking about helping out now will it will it hurt or hinder them so just those two thoughts before you okay all right well i all i always say about debt that i mean obviously you you should avoid it as much as you can and if you have it you should be very much on top of it um but if the first thing you think of when you wake up is your debt or if you the last thing you think of at night is your debt or you don't sleep because of it. Mm. You are in serious debt. Get help from one of the two free debt charities, uh, Step Change or um, National Debt Line. Step Change or National Debt Line. Um, and they will help you. Mm. However much your debt is, don't be embarrassed. They've seen it all before. Yep. Yep. 30, 50,000 pounds on a credit card you can't pay off. They have seen it. In fact, six figure sums are now coming to them, I know, in the last yeah. year or two. Mm. So always deal with it. Yeah. Open the envelopes. Don't leave them in a pile that frightens you in the corner. Mm. Always look at the bills, look at what you owe. And if you can't organize yourself to sit down and work out what you might do, get help from one of those two debt, char debt charities or Citizens Advice, which also is very, very mm. good at mm. dealing with this when you can get an appointment with them. Mm. But debt never gets better if you ignore it, it mm. only gets worse. So however bad it is today, mm. if you ignore it, it'll be worse tomorrow. I'm sorry yeah. to say that to people who are in that position. Now, of course, it's easy for me to say because I don't have debt and my income is, as I said earlier, adequate. But a lot of people are finding this for the first time with 
lockdown that with with being on furlough losing their jobs 120,000 people a month I think are mm. being made redundant mm. these are huge shocks for the financial system mm. and of course they're trying to claim universal credit and finding how difficult and how restrictive and how mean-minded some of the rules around that are so it, it is very 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 difficult but I think you know you look at can you sell anything have you got a skill have you got a hobby that you can turn into a something that does bring you in a bit of money i mean are there ways to increase your income mm. because i said that was my solution mm. to not having enough money mm. it's increase your income mm. as well as cut back on your expenditure and make sure you know you're not paying too much i mean there's all those little tips that, that i know you've got in your material and i mm. certainly talk a lot about but don't ignore debt if money frightens you if you say if you feel breathless about it Mm. get help because there is help out yeah. there absolutely yeah. you're not on your own that's right yeah no absolutely you absolutely aren't now the second point you asked was passing money on to the next generation <laughs> you see part of me has this view that i think i think people perhaps particularly english people and i mean english people as opposed to british or uk people have this sense that when you've got a bit of money, you're sort of, you're almost like the aristocracy, you know, and you'll pass on a house, you'll pass on a bit of land, you'll pass on some money to the next yeah. generation. Um, and of course, inherited wealth is the key to wealth. It absolutely is for, for many, many people, but not from the sort of wealth that ordinary people can pass on. Um, and my, my view about passing it on is, that's fine. If you die young, make sure you've got your will written, make sure you know who's going to get what, make sure they're going to get your pension fund mm. separate from your estate, and make sure that your your house is sensibly arranged, either, to, you know, make sure your estate goes to your, your mm. spouse or civil partner, because mm. then you don't pay. No one will pay inheritance tax. I should say only what four out of 100 estates pay mm. inheritance tax. Yeah. A lot of people are frightened of it. Don't be. No. If, if your estate's less than half a million and you've got a house, you won't and, it, pay. and it's not your problem, is it? It's your beneficiaries. Yeah. Well, and it's not your problem, no. No, the people who come to me talking about it are often the people who would inherit it. <laughs> so part of me thinks that your job in life is to spend all the money you've accumulated. Mm. Because, you know, I think about my mother um, who, who died, uh, well, 10 years ago now. And I was saying, to her, you know, don't worry take out an equity release plan, borrow money against the house, have some money, because she didn't have a great deal of money to, to spend, you know, spend what you want, spend what you need. We, children, my brother, sister and I, we want you to have the money you need to have a good life in retirement. We don't want you scrimping and saving. Um, so part of me thinks that the most important thing is to make sure you have enough yourself yeah not just to get by, but to do what you want, to have a mm. good time, because mm. most people have worked very hard in their working mm. lives and they need a good time in that last holiday, whether it's 10, 20 or 30 years that they have. Mm. So spend the money, don't worry about it. Don't worry about inheritance tax because almost no one will pay it. Mm. Um, and if you have a valuable house, then you can borrow money against it and do the things you want. I mean, goodness knows, it's not what well, you can do nowadays, is mm. that you yeah. can't. Tra travel around the world or take a cruise mm. it's very hard to spend mm. lots of money mm. now mm. um but you know don't worry about passing it on to the next generation because the chances are they're fine mm. um they may not be and if they aren't then again sit down and work out what money they might need and again give it to them before you die give it give them mm. a deposit on a house my yeah. goodness i saw some figures for the first time deposits on houses they are absolutely massive. Mm. They are mm. big five figure sums as a mm. deposit to buy a house. It's absolutely mm. extraordinary. That kind of money can only really come from parents, I think, mm. um, generally or inheritance. So help them out when they're alive, buy them what they need. And the other thing I think is, if you've got more than one child, don't worry about, oh, I gave them a thousand pounds, I've got to give them a, give them the money they need when they need it. Mm. So they feel that, you know, if they need a car now, Buy them, a, buy them an old car mm. if they need a house now you help them with the money for that if they need a rent deposit you help them when mm. they need it um and i think that you don't have to feel obliged to treat everyone the same mm. financially except for all of them to know that if they really really need something you're there and you'll do what you can to help them absolutely um and then if you die and you've got money and they inherit it well they'll probably be quite 
please, not that you died, hopefully, but that they've got a bit of extra money. But don't make it the focus of your life or your no, finances no. ever. No, or, or your relationship with your children or grandchildren. Yeah, yeah I get it. Well, I said to my uh, two daughters... Um, or you, you or your relationship with your children. No, that's absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. As I said to my girls, um, charities will receive as much as you receive in my lifetime and on my death. It's as simple as that. So that's my way of approaching it because society is just as important as the family. Yeah. Um, and, and that's my view. Good. Look, Paul, I've taken too much of your time. Thank you ever so much that's for your, your thoughts. Um, you still... Um, money Box is on most Saturdays, isn't it? Um, it's on every Saturday. I'm on almost all of them. It's yes. every Saturday midday yep. uh, on BBC Radio 4 and um, the cracking show on Saturday and you can hear it online if you just if you just google yep. BBC Moneybox you will find the link to BBC Sounds and you yep. can hear it and it's normally a bit longer because the the podcast version yeah the yeah. podcast version is what you hear if you don't hear it live on yep. Saturday no. so please listen and you know we cover some interesting stuff yeah and this is. isn't this isn't me this is a great team of people I have yes. to say that they yeah. are brilliant people who do it yeah, no, it's a brilliant show. I listen to it every Saturday afternoon on the podcast version. When As soon as it's uh, downloaded, I listen to it. It's a brilliant show. Paul, please, please keep on doing what you do. Appreciate your time today. Pearls of wisdom there, which, uh, you know, a lifetime of both uh, personal experience and uh, professional involvement in this has taught you. Um, thank you for your time. Really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. It, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I hope, it, I hope it's helpful to some people. Thanks for listening. If you want more money insights, do visit my website at jason-butler.com or connect with me on Twitter or Instagram at JB the Wealth Man. See you next time.